Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. Super. So do you want to introduce yourself to to our audience? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Diane Neals. I'm a director of uh, Lead Coach Manage, um, which is a consultancy. We specialize in um, training and developing future leaders. And also, um, I'm a master practitioner for well-being in the workplace, which uh, has is uh, an area that is very busy at the moment. I'm sure. I'm sure. I think um, now that the the government has provided, or at least the UK government has provided a bit of a plan to exit, I think there's a little bit more, not just relaxation, but a little bit more comfort uh, around some level of certainty. Yes, and and I think that's that's been the you know the buzzword really, Ryan, for the the last twelve months, the uncertainty that people have faced. But um, you know, I'm as as um, we start to come out. Obviously, we're coming out of lockdown here in the UK, and this is kind of the third time it's happened. There's there's still, we're pinning lots of hopes on the vaccination program. Um, and, you know, as spring is now coming through the 1st of March today, um, moods are definitely lifted, but there are still a massive amount of people that you know, we're continuing to work from home, lots of pressure, lots of furloughed people, uncertainty of jobs, etc. So mm. it's a telling time. It really is. Yeah, you mentioned um, the furlough scheme and that sort of stuff, but I, I think it's not so much people wanting to be paid to stay at home. It's more that, that purpose of work that they're looking for. It is. You're absolutely right. And there's there's a recent study actually by Westfield Health that that has looked at um, three different cohorts of those that have continued to work, those that are furloughed and those that um, are working from home. And there's a lot of um, commonalities between the three groups in that they all are worried about the future of their jobs. But they're looking at people, so those that have continued to work, so sort of like manufacturing, et cetera, plants that we work with who um, who have to go in and there's lots of COVID testing going on all the time. They're looking mm. at people who are uh, working from home and saying, oh, you get all this time with your family. We don't. We've worked every day because obviously we've got to produce the food um, that uh, lots of people were in initially hoarding um, and uh, and they're sort of looking enviously at those working from home. Those working from home are saying, well, at least you get out and you're able to still mm. have purpose, uh, whereas we stare at a computer eight to ten hours a day. Tend to, they tend to do more work because they want to be seen that they're working as well. Um, mm. and, uh, and then you've got the furloughed people that – some of them have said they're living their best lives because they've really tuned into exercise, etc. But many have lost that sense of purpose completely. Um, and mm. that, that that's where you then start to get into negative thinking. Uh, moods definitely are pulled down, um, losing routine, um, uh, etc. And actually seeing when what is my future? So, so there's an awful lot of people that I spend do one-to-one coaching with that are really struggling, really struggling. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. I mean, you, you know, when I I look back to when we were in the UK, um, lot, you know, the first lockdown, as you mentioned, and we went through the lockdown in November before we flew out to South Africa, and we had a small lockdown here. It, it didn't change our lives too much, um, but. Been, been, you know, going now. We're a year down the road, almost a year and well, three weeks time. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know what I don't know how we would have coped with another lockdown with with two kids and and and, and our kids are young. Um, but it, you know, being able to work anywhere in the world has definitely changed the the game a bit. Um, and I've spoken to two other people today that also took the opportunity to get out 
for December, you know, to Greece and to uh, to, to one place in Greece and one place in Cyprus. Yeah. Um, where the risk has been a lot lower, uh -huh. and and they, you know, said that's that's the new normal for them. They don't have to be in an office every day, so for them, it's a psychological safety thing um, and a Literally. family safety thing. Yeah, um, and that's that's going to be the difference, you know. That um, I was on a call with some um, leaders last week, and there's an awful lot of talk, you know, things like absenteeism and presenteeism are seen as all-time lows at the moment because everyone's mm. at home. Um, and if you, I don't know whether you've noticed that hardly anybody's got a cold at the moment either because we're socially distancing well, which is great. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that ability to work anywhere in the world, and I think that's what's changed about our business as well. Um, in, in lockdown one, we, we could, you know, the business could have just gone down because we, we were, uh, going out to see our clients, maybe mainly UK based clients. Uh, we're also providers, um, uh, in Greater Manchester for, for the business growth, for so we were doing a, a lot of training externally for them. Um, so we were out of of our homes all the time, seeing clients. So we had to sit back and say, right, well, how do we look at this? What what? How can we actually still keep this business going? So it was mm -hmm. it was turning to the conferencing that enabled us to do that. And going back to your point of going to Greece and Cyprus, as soon as lockdown opened, each time. My husband and I, we were straight on, uh, were, you know, out on holiday to Portugal and uh, and Tenerife just before Christmas, um, wherever we could go, because we can still run our business from wherever mm. we are. So long as we've got a decent Wi-Fi code, we can still run it. Yeah. Which is great for us. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that is so cool um, that you could do that because, you know, if you look at the the – I mean, what most most roles are actually remote based roles. If you think about it, which means from a business point of view, you can actually hire anyone that's within a plus or two plus or minus two hours time zone. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, yourself. You know, it's, it's unfortunately those, as you mentioned, the sort of frontline operators. Uh, you know, a hairdresser, a cook, a cleaner. They're the people that you know their job still is at at, the, at that location. Um, and that that's really telling for uh, especially us ladies that uh, uh, I was looking at a photograph of me the other day uh, 12 months ago and my hair is so much longer now so much grayer <laughs> I've even got my husband doing my roots at the moment you know things are, <laughs> things are really um, changed in our home um, and but he won't let me cut his hair which I'm quite disappointed in oh, I can understand that <laughs> took me a, a couple a couple of weeks. It got to about the you know during lockdown one. I think it was about six weeks before uh, I let my wife cut my hair. Um, but I don't I don't have a lot of hair to work with, so I've got protected. Um, you mentioned something, and I wanted to go back to it. Oh, the the, the being being always available um, yeah. aspect to working now because you're at home. Um, I mean, I went through a bit of guilt initially where I felt like I had to be working all the time. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you'd pop out to help the kids downstairs or you'd be cooking dinner. We did the, um, uh, what's it called? Where they deliver the food in a box and you cook it. Oh, yeah. Um, it was called, um, HelloFresh. Yes, we did HelloFresh. So, you know, I used to pop down at five o'clock and cook that meal, but, you know, the other guys would still be working. So you, while you're cooking, you're still getting messages on Teams or whatever it is to, to carry on conversations about stuff. Um, and, yeah, and I had to put boundaries in. Um, Especially now that I'm a South African, it's two hours ahead. You know, I've got to balance that as well. Have you seen much of that in your research or your discussions with other customers? Um, I, I think boundaries. Um, so, so the area that we work in is called RAW. That stands for Workplace Resilience and Wellbeing. Um, and it looks at uh, what we call the five pillars of resilience. One of the pillars is energy. And when hmm. you about how you build your energy, we look at sort of, you know, the physical aspect, nutrition, hydration, etc. But a big component of energy is boundary setting. So we have long conversations with individuals and teams around 
what boundaries are you going to put in place? And, and when we, when we look at a team or a whole organization and one of the pressure points in that system is workload, um, and not being able to step away from the computer, it's about taking ownership of that and sort of saying, how can we change that? What boundaries can we set? There is, if we were in an office, would we behave the same way? What is mm. making us behave in this way that we feel that we can be available to everybody all the time? So it's about changing that mindset and communicating with your colleagues that they will see that change as well. Because mm. you just put a boundary uh, in to say that, uh, you know, I won't be replying to emails between, I don't know, 12 and 1 so I can sit down and have lunch with my family. Um People, some people might not like to see that because they've been used to seeing you at that time when they've wanted it or putting times in your calendar when you've not really controlled that. So it's very important to when you do set your boundaries that you inform and communicate out why you're doing it. And people are very accepting of it. You know, I'm working mm. with a big global pharmaceutical company at the moment and they are Absolutely. Encouraging their people to sort of say, take time out, go for a walk, leave the screen for every every 20 minutes, walk away from the screen, check your eyes, because, you know, you can become, you can get to the point where you're finding more work to showcase that you're still there to everyone. Mm. And you don't need to do that. Um, and going back to your point about psychological safety, so I'm doing a, a diploma in psychological safety at the moment, and there's an awful lot of case studies that we're looking at through, this is through Professor Amy Edmondson's work from Harvard, um, and, you know, a lot of the time is, is that people don't speak up, people don't feel that they uh, have a safe environment to speak up about and say, how can we change things, because they may be judged they may feel that they might be judged or put or set back for saying we this needs to change. So they just yeah. carry on on that cycle. Yeah, it's it's interesting how you. I mean, I, so so in the UK, I worked one way. When I got to South Africa, I, I slightly changed, and most of the reason for the change um, was a two-hour difference. So because I was, we were two hours ahead, I, I meant it. So in, in the UK, I had an hour booked out for my sort of brain work. Yes. You know, because what was happening, if you didn't book something in your diary, someone else would book something in your diary. Mm -hmm. So you'd end up with, you know, like today, it's just back to back calls the whole day. Yeah. Um, so I used to have a slot booked out, which was my one hour of, it used to be, it would either be fitness or it would be time with the kids or whatever it is. But it would be a break from screens and, and all that sort of stuff. And then we came here, so I cancelled that slot. I said, well, I don't need that slot because I've got all this time in the morning to go to gym and, you know, yeah. do stuff with, and all that sort of thing. But after about two weeks of not having that break and just doing back to back calls, you get to sort of three o'clock in the afternoon and you've done nothing just sit yeah. on calls and you're, and you're mentally exhausted because all you've done is be switched on the whole time so I've had to put it back in again now obviously yeah. every so often I have have um, a call that goes in there but at least it gives me some sort of buffer before the end of the day Yeah. so that and you can actually do something besides just talk to people on the phone all the time absolutely and and sometimes you know there's a few leaders now that are, are actually putting on their um, on the bottom of their emails, their signatures. Um, sometimes you might want to speak to me on the telephone rather than, you know, we've got into this habit of having uh, virtual conferencing all the time. And that, that, you know, you have to be so attentive in that point that it's, if you're in a, if you're in a boardroom and people were, um, in conversation, you'd be looking elsewhere. You'd be, um, you know, Drinking water, you'd be, you'd be writing things down. You're not constantly staring at a screen as we are now. And that's mm. where the exhaustion comes in. Um, but so it's, I'm so pleased to hear you've gone back to, um, putting that time back in your calendar. Uh, because you were, you know, you made some really fantastic changes the first time we spoke. I was really impressed at how you'd recognize that you needed to take that t time to step back recoup, recalibrate, and go again. And that's what it's all about. 
Yeah, I think, I think maybe we should go through some of that. So we did um, – we met on the Virgin on Execs yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we sort of chatted and, and I did the survey, the, the mm-hmm. WAR – W survey. I don't know if you want to give some background to that first, and then we can talk about sort of what came out of that. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 raw um, program is developed by a group of mental health professionals, um, uh, London-based mental health professionals, and it brings in cognitive behaviour, uh, positive um, and cognitive psychology, um, and and it's a, a psychometric questionnaire that you complete. Um, it takes about 15 minutes. You know, it's an easy, it's a link I send you. Um, but what I find from it is. It not only gives me real insight into an individual, it's a great platform for conversation. Um, There there are many people that sort of dial into coaching sessions and are unsure of how much they can share or want to share, whereas this gives us that platform for those conversations. We talk about energy levels. It's split into five pillars of resilience. So it's energy, future focus, inner drive, flexible thinking and strong relationships. And we go through each one of those pillars looking at not just at how you score, because that's kind of the, that moment in time that you made, that you, you did the report. You may feel very differently when we speak, but it's also, you know, where you want to be, what, what you can actually do to change. Um, and you know, there's some great hints and tips that we can share with you. And incidentally, um, on that note, uh, starting today on LinkedIn, we're putting, uh, posts every single day of people that we've worked with that have put, um, gone on a bite-sized video with my colleague Sue, um, who are going to share some of the hints and tips that they've put in over the last 12 months. Um, walking seems to be like the new black, really. It's kind of every, yep, yep. <laughs> everyone's got into walking. Um, but, you know, when you walk, You've got that visual stimulation. You're taking in vitamin D. You, you know, a lot of people walk and talk on the phone. I personally listen to audio books. So that's mm-hmm. my way of checking out and having that hour and a half time for me. Um, yeah. and, you know, and that self care piece, I think people have learned to try to be a bit more selfish with their time. And, and that is working really well for people. At least they're getting outside. Yeah, and I, and I don't think it's selfish. I think it's it's self care. Yeah. Um, you know, as you say, vitamin D. I mean, I, I use an app now so I can measure my vitamin D while I'm walking. Ooh. Um, and I and I obviously take a tablet as well, so I measure those yeah. th- that as well. Uh, like you, I listen to something, so I see the podcasts or or that, or I do my calls that I need to do. Yeah. Um, but it is it is to get out, and and I think you you need you need the time also for your brain to. Not only you'd be absorbing information, but also to wonder a bit and and solve problems that you don't. If you just back to back all the time, you don't get a chance to to do that. You're absolutely right, and 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 allow your your creative part of your brain to kick in as well. You know, and like you say, mm. problem solving. Um, sometimes you are, you're walking along and say, "Why didn't I look at it from that perspective before?" Because actually, you've allowed your brain to be more creative. Um, and you've got that freedom then rather than when you're really pushing yourself, sometimes it just doesn't come. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, that, that time out for me, um, is, uh, is, is fantastic. And, and there's a re, you know, there's a, there's a, a fantastic analogy. Um, Enzo Ferrari was asked many years ago why his cars were winning. Grand Prix when, when obviously Ferrari was doing very well. Um, and, uh, and he said, you know, and they said, what have you changed in the car? Is it the aerodynamics, whatever? And he said, the essential part of a car is brakes mm. uh, because a track has corners. So you've got to learn to brake and then mm. again. And that's really my motto in life. It's kind of making sure you build those brakes in. To be able mm. to again. No, I think you're spot on. I mean, I, you know, with what, what we're doing now with this, this digital way of working, um, it's too easy to not have have those gaps. You don't have the you don't have the commute anymore. You don't have the um, you know the 
go get lunch because you're at the office and you need somebody to eat, so you walk outside. Mm-hmm. You know, you're at home. You might shoot downstairs to get something to eat out the fridge, but then you're back up in you know in yeah. three minutes. Uh, yeah. So you need. To- and you got you got a danger of probably doing about five hundred steps in a day then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, well, I've, I've still kept, I've still kept my my target of of twelve and a half thousand a day. So, well, yeah, I mean, that's a, a very admirable uh, target. That is wow. Well, well, ironically, in the UK, it used to be fifteen thousand, but we walk less here. Yeah. Um, because you drive everywhere. Um, and and it's just one of those. So twelve and a half is still the target, but yeah, ideally fifteen. Wow. Well, good, good on you. Yeah. Some, some days I leave, leave my office. Um, and when I've got, you know, we've got back to back workshops on and so it's unavoidable on some days, but, uh, I, I've probably done a thousand steps in the day. And then I'm sitting there thinking, well, why am I feeling so lethargic? Why, you know, um, so it's, it's so important as well that, you know, when you're online is to hydrate, high, I, I say, well, if you're going to take anything away from our conversation, just drink more water. Just, yeah. Yeah. Your, your brain is 80% water. Um, yeah. and, so, and you'll lose about two and a half liters a day just by existing, perspiring, water vapor, urine. You know, that, that's, yeah. you'll lose per day. So most of us are walking around dehydrated and we expect yeah. our brains to function just like you know, automatic. Come on, what's letting yeah. me down today? Why, why have I suddenly got a brain fog? Perhaps maybe have a glass of water and see if it makes a yeah. difference. Yeah, I, um, I got into the habits and, and, and the, the, the reason I know it works. So every morning I have two glasses of water and I can almost feel as I drink it. And this is why I'm bringing it up. As, as you drink it, you can feel it actually go through your system. The, yes. And then you know you haven't had enough. And then if I have it later in the day, then I know that, oh, geez, I've let, I let it go too yeah. long. Um, so, yeah, I think you're spot on there. Um, let's go back to, to the raw report. I mean, are you doing that now as a, as a common thing with your customers? Or yeah. Or have you yeah. got other, other tools you use as well? Uh, it's, it's, pr- it's, it's pretty much 8% of our business now. Um, and, uh, in the leadership development, we'll do other questionnaires, you know, we'll, we'll do like behavioral styles, learning styles, communication skills, all that sort of stuff. But, but Roar is, has become so, um, important, um, you know, and, and companies are now recognizing this, you know, for every one pound that's invested, in in this area of um, and we work in sort of the, the resilience, not mental ill health. We're building resilient teams and resilient mm-hmm. individuals. Um, if you invest a pound on average, you're getting about just over five pounds back. Um, oh wow! Some, some uh, and that's the latest Deloitte data. Um, so they they analyze this every two years. Um, and some, some organizations have really changed their color, uh, cu- culture and that of psychological safety. They're seeing about 11 to, to 15 pounds return on for every one pound invested. Um, but it opens so many doors for people in that they're able to speak more frankly about how they feel. Um, and that some are really struggling to navigate through problems. Um, so we're giving them different tools on how to look at that in a different way, um, how to frame things better so it comes across more positive, how their brain works, what hormones and neurotransmitters they're releasing when they are under stress and when they okay. uh, uh, you know, um, on the other side, when they're relaxed and they're feeling really chilled and, and motivated, what, what hormones are being released then? So it's encouraging them to, then to think about that mindset. And if you're framing things more positive, um, and thinking about when you're in a meeting about what went well, as opposed to what didn't go so well, you'll then start to see the mood change so much in the team. So that's really important. And are, are you measuring the mood somehow? I mean, are, are they answering that through surveys beyond this or is it sort of coaching? Well, what, we, what we tend to say is really once we've got a baseline raw report, then we'll, we'll do one-to-one coaching with individuals and, and team workshops where they'll basically build a charter on how they're going to support each other. 
Um, and then we'll say three months later, let's, let's repeat that raw report and see, you know, where, how far you've come. And then let's look at, we, so we never work on all five pillars at the same time. We pick out, if it's a team, a couple of pillars to work on and then track and that measure. And that's what I really like about RAW is that you've got that outcome-based measurement that um, that you can look at. Incidentally, on the psychological safety um, course that I'm on at the moment, there's a, there's a scan for that as well. So okay. RAW and psychological safety, you know, they go hand in hand for me. When you say scan, you mean a... Uh, um a CAT scan or a functional it's, scan? It's, or? A, it's, a, uh, uh, it's seven questions and they can be done in five minutes, but it's all about the conversation, the team conversation. Why? And, you know, psychological safety is, uh, Amy Edmondson talks a lot about teaming. It's about, you know, Google's data over five years is uh, Project Aristotle, and they looked at how they can get the best team. What does the best team look like? Yeah. And you might think that's the collection of the best brains, et cetera. But a lot of the time it's about how people come together on a social aspect as well, how you get the opposites that attract and bounce off each other and debate uh, to get mm. really, really good ideas coming through. Um, so, you know, that, that scan basically looks about how that team works together um, and do they feel that they can actually say things without being judged or um, mm. talked over, et cetera? So, yeah, it's a very interesting field. And I think, you know, that's that's the next big thing that companies are really looking at is psychological safety. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, one of the, the obvious, the, the, the common sort of questions is now that we're going out of lockdowns and, you know, in theory, everyone will be vaccinated on the planet for the next two to three years. Do we go back to the office now or are we going to stay in this hybrid model or are we going to, you know, stay remote working? Um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a, a good question. Sorry, yeah, yeah I, it's a good question because I think moving forward, like you say, people have found, I mean, with Sue, Sue, my business partner and I, we'll definitely stay online because we're working with global teams. Now we work with China, Japan, the U, we've got the USA this afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. if traveling any, everywhere, which, you know, in our previous lives, we worked in the pharmaceutical industry and every week you were traveling somewhere. Um, yeah. actually this medium makes the world a smaller place. You don't get to see it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is the downside, but you actually get to build your business um, and reach out to much more people with this medium. Yeah, no, you're so right. Because the other question is, you know, if you look at the high streets and, and the malls, you know, people have gotten so used to online shopping because yeah. they've had to get used to it. You know, will those survive? And I think they, I think both will survive, both, store, you know, going back to work and and going back to the malls because there will always be someone that wants to still do it face to face. Uh, yeah. now, now it's not the only way. And those I things will just balance out naturally. I agree with you. And I think, you know, women, women, especially, uh, you know, there's a lot of men that, but you know, women are known for shopping. <laughs> Aren't we? We meet our friends, we go for lunch, we have a great day out shopping, lots of conversation. If we just did that online, there's, there's that element missing. And I, I'm somebody, I'm, I'm very kinesthetic and I like to feel, uh, clothes mm. to be able to try it on, see how it looks and, you know, ask other people how it looks. And we're losing a lot of that interaction. Uh, so I, I do hope that we won't have, um, everything online still because I think that, that just that, getting yourself ready, going out, meeting friends, that whole social interaction, it, you know, I, I miss that terribly. Yeah, I saw a great um, poem in um, a doctor's office about, I hope that we, through this, we realize the, um, the value of other people, uh, shop, shop shelves that are full, yeah. um, you know, all the kind of things that, that we've all, I'll, I'll try and find it and send it. Um, that, I think that's what we we needed a reset in that sense. It was too much of a rat race. Everyone just trying to go faster and become more robotic, um, and it, and you've almost had to be forced to slow down. 
Yes. Um, and to appreciate what you can, what you can't do anymore that you could just, you just took for granted you could have done before. Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, a lot of people now are building, um, or doing gratitude journals and things like that. It's mm. just been, it's been grateful for, for what you have, which, you know, we're going back to the, the pandemic again, but there's a, there's a, a really, really great tip that, um, Martin Zelligman, who's the father of positive psychology. So he, he was the one that basically founded this, write down three things each day mm. that, that I've gone well for you or that you're grateful for. And if you do that, you know, by the end of the year, you've got over a thousand things that you have found have gone well for you or, um, mm. or you're grateful for. And, and that's fantastic to reflect back on and going back to, you know, how you change your mood and things, just looking at those things that have gone well in the day. And it may be, you know, the sun was out today, so I actually I went for a walk. Um, I've just been down the road lo- looking for a cat and my cat following me down the road. And that actually made me happy because the, it's like mm. looking for the cat. But, um, but you know, th- those little things we need to remember when people say, gosh, all I do is work and I've got nothing else. Just think about what's gone well for you that day. You will find three things. And his data absolutely proved it. You know, he he was working with 50 of the most depressed people uh, whose depression scores meant that they were so low, they, they struggled to get out of bed. Um, and just seeing that in one week, writing three things down each day, Actually, when he tested them at the end of the week, their depression scores had come right down and their happiness scores had gone right up because they were just changing their mindset. Yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, it's something I used to do. I'll be honest, I don't do it as much in the sense of writing it down, but I, I, I kind of live my day through pictures. So I always try to take three or four pictures a day. Specifically where the kid's doing something. And then that goes into a journal, which, you know, like I got a, a reminder today of 11 pictures that we took the other day. So, you know, that's, I said that way. Yeah. Um, so I definitely, I definitely agree that it works. Yeah. I just think you're going to find what works for you. Absolutely. Um, yeah. 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 Cool. So, so what do you see the future like then? I mean, what do, you, what do you see? How do you think work will go? How do you think the digital working will go? I think, I think. There will be a mixture of both the office based and, um, you know, digital, I think is here to stay. The, uh, incidentally, you know, my, in my previous roles, even though I, you know, there was travel involved to different countries, I managed teams who all worked, who were all home based. We weren't office based. So, mm-hmm. you know, these virtual conferencing mediums have, We've used them for 20 years. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, that, that they will always continue. Whether the number of big office buildings will continue, I'm unsure. I would hate to see mm-hmm. them, uh, not being brought back to life. It seems such a shame, but I think there will be the combination of the two. And a, and a lot of companies are, you know, certainly at the beginning of lockdown one said, you're not going back into the office this year. Here's the computer stuff. Here's everything that you'll need to work from home. Um, mm. and, and a lot of, a lot of organizations have been very, very supportive of their employees, um, especially those that are homeschooling too, because that's been so tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll be honest. That's something that we were worried about. Hence we, hence we took the flight out. Um, not that our kids were old enough to be homeschooled, but just to, just to have the school available. Um, and, and, you know, place the kids to go every day. So, okay. And, and what's your, your setup like at home? I mean, are you, are you now building the, the dedicated office with, with the standing desk and, and all that sort of stuff? Or you? We talked about a standing desk, didn't we? You know, and I'm still, I'm still deliberating over that because I, I did see some data the other day that, um, that said actually, uh, uh there's a use for standing desk, but it's not, um, the uh, it's not the data isn't um that strong to say don't sit i think mm. what it, what we've um what the data did say was 
what we've got is now big, easy backed office chairs. So we tend to slouch. Um, mm. that's not great for our skeleton. Um, but I do find myself, um, standing up quite regularly since I talked to you about your standing desk and, uh, and, uh, uh, it's hard for me to present. Uh, but if I was in, in a, in a room, in an office, I would always be standing up to present. So it's strange. Mm. I find it difficult. Maybe it's because I just haven't got my equipment set up in a way that allows me to do that just now. But um, I'm still I'm still um, thinking about doing that because I think uh, it, I, I'd feel more grounded as well. Yeah, I think it depends on what you're doing. So I, I like the standing desk for talking. So like, like yeah. this and, and that. But if I'm doing something that requires like, like if I'm studying or I'm writing a document or something, then I like to sit for that. Let's sit. Yeah. And I think there must be something, there must be something in your brain that says because you're sitting, you can focus more. Yeah. Whereas if you're standing, it needs, it needs to be more aware or something. I don't know. Um, so, that's, that's the way how I did. Yeah. So I've got an office at home. I've, um, you know, I've always had this office and um, my husband also works from home now. Uh, so he's, uh, we've converted to the bedroom for him. So he's upstairs and I, and I do get the shout down. Um, can you put some more paper in the photocopier, please? Um, on a regular basis uh, from him. But um, yeah, we seem to coordinate quite well and are re- very respectful of each other, especially we're on, if we're on conferences as well. Uh, so yeah, it, yeah. It, it works well for us, but uh, I do, you know, Sue and I do are able to go into an office and uh, we've done presentations. We did a, in September, we did a whole three day virtual conference for a large uh, organization, um, all all on RAW. So, you know, um, uh, over 100 people all had a RAW report and it was all aggregated up. So they got the whole organization view. Um, and every day we, we did um, videos to them. And because it was different time zones, it was a global conference. So we were online videos, live conference, live breakouts. And that was enormous. Fun. We did it together, sharing a screen together uh, in the office, which was which was really good. Wow. You get the energy from each other then. Yeah. How long were the sessions? Um, so we were on between uh, sort of 10 and 2 o'clock each day. Okay. Uh, but we'd done pre-recordings as well, which they, they, they got on demand, which was which was right. good for them because we've got, you That's know, an... Australia dialing in uh, or dialing out as we, <laughs> you know, <laughs> stay on late for us. Yeah. 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 No, that's. I mean, yeah. I think I think those those sort of eight hour workshops days are also gone, thankfully. Oh, yeah. In the sense of more 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 focused short short periods. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I think I think um, the, the full day workshop. Um, it, you know, it's too much to ask of people to be fully uh, in the in the moment all the time. It's just you, you know, it's better to have these short sharp bursts, and I I feel much more energized from them. Oh, totally. Uh, and I think there's also that, that back, back thought about what are my kids doing or what's happening downstairs in the house that I need to, you know, so, so having the breaks also, also yeah. helps. <laughs> yeah. Great. So, so where can people get hold of you if they want to get hold of you? Um, yes. Yeah, so the, I, we have a website, uh, www.leadcoachmanage.co.uk. So all one word. Um, and that basically comes from the way we were trained. So um, when we, we both met, gosh, 25 years plus ago, uh, working for GlaxoSmithKline, and we had the pleasure of being put in through so many qualifications and uh, at the time not really appreciating it, but very much appreciating it now. Um, and uh, leadership first, basically lead your people, set that vision, get them to follow you. Uh, coach them to be more autonomous and be creative and then manage them when you need to. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So that's why we're called the Coach Manage. Um, and uh, you obviously can find me on LinkedIn under Diane Neald um, and Twitter, also Lead Coach Manage. Um, I, you just, just as you were saying that, I realized there's a book that I wanted to recommend to you, which is Turn the Boat Around. Turn the Ship Around. Turn the Ship Around, okay. Turn the Ship Around. Um, David Marquette is the is the author. It's a submarine captain, yeah. and 
it's uh, how he took his crew who were the worst in the Navy to being one of the best in the Navy. But changing one of the key things was changing that from a, a leader follower mentality to a leader leader mentality. Yeah. So leadership with intent. Um, and as you were saying, I was thinking, yeah, I was actually not forget. So worth worth a read. I've, it's written down because you know I enjoy a book. <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> Super. Well, thanks, Diane. It was good well, to catch thank up. You. Thank you very much, Ryan. It's a pleasure. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues. 